Chapter 7 of our AIS textbook gets into data analysis and presentation. And I think this is a really fun chapter because we've done a lot of work with data so far. We haven't really talked about techniques to kind of help you deal with showing this in a convincing fashion to an audience. And so this chapter is going to really get into that aspect of the course. Now there's a couple of different pieces of this. First off, we're going to talk about analytics in general. Uh, what are analytics and what are kind of the four different levels of them? Then we'll talk about how to choose the right kind of visualization. So there's a lot of built-in tools in Excel and some of them are better than others. We're going to talk about which ones are better and why. Then we'll start talking about design principles. What are some things you can do to make your charts look better? And especially, what are some expectations in this class for presentations? And I want to be very prescriptive in this part of the course. I have a certain aesthetic I want teams to shoot for when they do their presentations. This is not the only way to do presentations, but it's what I want you to work on in this class because it's very data heavy. And so I want very chart heavy presentations. So let's talk about the four different levels of data analytics. We start off with the descriptive layer. A descriptive layer basically says what happened. So using our example of a coffee shop, we might want to know what are my sales for today? What are my sales for yesterday? What are my sales for last year? But it's stri strictly descriptive. It says what did happen and it's kind of the, the first level. Once you've done descriptive work, you then probably want to get into diagnostic work. Diagnostic asks the question, why? So what happened could be my sales last year were a million dollars and this year they're only $800,000. Diagnostic would say, why did they go down? And so you might look at the data and find out that maybe one of your stores is opening later in the day than normal. And so you're losing sales for the first two hours of the day, which turned out to be a big part of the business. Or it could be that the mixture of product you're selling has gotten less profitable over time. But diagnostic looks at the data and tries to assign some kind of cause and effect relationship. This is the level I want most of your stuff in the class to focus on. We're going to have these simulations and games and things, but diagnostic really forces you to look at the cause and effect relationship. Don't just say, here are my sales for the year. Instead, say, why did my sales go down? Or why did they go up? What did I do well or what did I do badly? And part of this is that sometimes it's not enough just to know that things have changed. If you have the wrong reason, that's just as bad as having the wrong data. And so cause and effect means you try to figure out what's the relationship between these two elements here. Predictive goes a step further. Now this is more likely to be in future classes where we look more at AI and machine learning techniques. But this says forecasting. What's likely to happen in the future? Now in this class, uh, you might say, all right, we did this, right? We dropped our prices, so we sold more, but our profits went down. If you want, you can also do a predictive level saying, if we had do differently in the future, here's what the outcomes would be. Or maybe even if we had done something differently, here's what they would have been. But both of these are prediction elements, saying with these current values or with these current trends, what's the cause and effect going to be? And then what's the outcome result going to be? Prescriptive gets at what should be. So it should be involves some kind of optimization problem. You might say, all right, so if I predict the future, I'm saying you know, with the current sales tax rate and the current customers, here's what my profit should be next year. Prescriptive instead says, here are three different price points. I tested each price point and this price point is the one that has the highest value. But it always involves some kind of optimization, trying different scenarios and picking the best one. Now that could be really sophisticated with like a general AI model or with some regression, or it could be literally just plugged in five different values and pick the best one. And they all kind of stack on each other, right? Descriptive kind of is the first step. And as you go up the chain, you go up in complexity and you go up in value added to the organization. So complexity, descriptive analytics are you know, basic tables in Excel, not too fancy. Diagnostic, you look at maybe some charting to show relationships between things, or if you want to be fancy, we could do correlation or regressive. Predictive means you take the equation that you made with regression and diagnostic, and you put in different values and try them out. And prescriptive says you try a whole bunch of different scenarios and see what's the best option. However, there's also a lot of value adds, so each of these kind of layer on the prior. So let's get into descriptive analytics. 
right? We're going to do an exploratory data analysis. Now, this is different from what you might have seen in a stats class. A stats class really emphasizes things like hypothesis testing. And they're very formal, where you're trying out different elements, and talking about sampling and t-tests and all kind of stuff. Now, with companies, often it's kind of a different model. We typically have very complete data. So in a stats class, if you're surveying the US population, you might survey 1,000 people. And you want to know, do my answers have generalizability? Can I extrapolate to say that the entire US looks like my sample? It's different for a company, though. With a company, typically you have all of the sales recorded. Instead, what you're more concerned with is what are the trends that I see? You don't really care as much about statistical significance because you, you have the results. Like, this is the population. You have all the data. The question is more, do you have the right kind of data? And can you answer questions that you want to talk about with the data that you have? With diagnostic sort of tests, we can use a little bit more of those formal techniques, you know, hypothesis testing, t-testing kind of stuff. And we're going to more do confirmatory data analysis because you're trying to make a cause and effect relationship. So you might say, all right, we have a relationship, but how, how firm are we? How confident are we? And as an analyst, you always want to include the element of uncertainty in your reporting. You know that anything that's happened could have happened differently or it might be the result of random chance. So you want to give a bit of you know, covering yourself, but also just honesty. You're saying, hey, here's what we think, but here's how confident we are in that. And this is where you'd probably do something like a hypothesis test or statistical measures. So with hypothesis testing, if you kind of think back to your stats class, you had kind of the null hypothesis versus the alternative. And again, you can do that in this class. It's not as much of a focus, but this is kind of be where you tie that other course in with what we're doing here. And one key concept is the kind of idea of false positive or false negative. So we have a type 1 error is a false positive. So this is the example on the left where a person who is not pregnant is told they are pregnant. And then a false negative is the opposite, saying you're not pregnant with someone who is actually pregnant. And so we think about this with something like fraud. If we're doing fraud tests, we would much rather have type 1 errors than type 2 errors. I'd much rather say, hey, these 10 people look a bit suspicious, and then only one of them actually commits fraud. That, that's fine, because um, I want to make sure I pull everybody in. What I don't want is a type 2 error or a false negative. That means I miss someone. Someone who is committing fraud doesn't get looked at. Now, the, the opposite could be true as well. Maybe I'm doing investments, and I'm really concerned with only making solid investments. I don't ever want to lose money. So what you might say, or they, you think of this like a bank, right? A bank never wants to lose money on a loan. So they're going to optimize to get away from type 1 errors and two type 2 errors. So in other words, I don't ever want to give someone money if they shouldn't get money. I am okay with actually missing out on some opportunities. So I'm missing the pregnancy. I'm missing the opportunity because I want to optimize for type 2 errors instead of type 1 errors. So both of these are important concepts to bear in mind because different Organizations have different risk profiles, and they want different outcomes. Now, when we look at t-tests, you probably remember this sort of thing here. So the idea is that we have some kind of normal distribution. So normal distribution has sort of a median and midpoint value over here, and then I have a certain range inside of likely outcomes, and then I have unlikely events at the side. That's your p-value. All right, predictive. Now that I've done my stats test, I've looked at my exploratory data analysis. I want to try and predict something that happens in the future. So there are basic steps here as I'm first going to pick what's my target. What am I trying to predict or optimize? So a simple example of this could be your Starbucks. and You're trying to decide how many coffee cups should I buy this week? Or how many pounds of coffee should I buy this week? Or how many cups of coffee should I make in the morning? Right? These are all sorts of different target outcomes. We're then going to try and grab data appropriate for that. So probably historical sales would be the best one. And I want to create some kind of model. A model is just a mathematical expression where I say take some number, multiply, add, do whatever. So as an example here, I might say my model is predicting how many pounds of coffee I want to buy each week. A good data would be historical sales, you know, how many customers have purchased coffee every week. And then I'll take that and just plug it into an equation and say, all right, so on average, I need a pound of coffee for every four customers. And so then I say, okay, next week I think I want to have eight customers, so I'm going to put that in and chug out whatever my answer is. 
So extrapolation means I'm taking these and I'm going to plug them into something. And usually you want to do this graphically. And the idea here is you take your predictive model and then you're going to plug it into historical data and say, all right, historically speaking, here's how my model would have performed. And then also to think about average prediction error. So if my model predicts something, how far above or below the actual value is it? And that's asking the question, how well is your model actually working? And so we can kind of think of this visually. We collect our data, we clean it up, we identify patterns in it, and then we make some kind of predictions and foresight. So we can see in my, my data pattern, I can see a pattern in the blue. I extrapolate and make prediction that's going to happen with the other ones as well. And this could have been something like I have a new store. So I have an old store, and here's this pattern of how sales have increased over time versus my new stores. And I say, okay, well, if my new stores look like the old stores, here's what I should expect to happen in the future. Then we have prescriptive. Prescriptive is looking at recommendations. So this looks forward to things like AI, machine learning. Uh, we're doing a lot more predictive work. And these ones are going to have more automatic learning built into the algorithm than what I would expect for a basic prescriptive or predictive. These are generally going to be handled in higher level classes, and we're not going to touch it as much in this course here. But the basic idea is that I'm going to take some kind of outcome, I'm going to work on my models, and I'm going to do things like take my data and split it into test versus train. You know, I'm going to train my data on one set and then test it on another set. So there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with prescriptive analytics. All right, so what are some common issues? What are some problems I have? Well, one key problem is extrapolation beyond the range of the data. What does that mean? Well, it basically means you, you're trying to predict something you just don't have data for. Let's say I've opened up two Starbucks stores in downtown Morgantown, and I want to open up one in Fairmont. Well, how relatable is Morgantown and Fairmont? Right? They're very different cities, very different populations. So I may not be able to extrapolate to Fairmont for my performance in Morgantown. I might also need to consider the variation in the model. If I make a model saying that I'm going to predict how many bags of coffee to buy each week, Great, it might be roughly accurate, but then I had to think, all right, how often is that wrong? Like if I look at like say 4th of July week, maybe I have a lot more sales because we're people are on vacation that week. Well, if I don't consider that variation, I might under purchase because I trust too heavily in the model. We can see some examples of this in the real world. One of the famous examples is the Challenger disaster where the space shuttle took off and then blew up. Now, you think, well, what, what happened? What went wrong with this? Well, this is the actual slides used by NASA as they were trying to decide should they launch the rocket or not. I think we can tell it's, it's a bit difficult to interpret. This is a slightly better chart. This one shows the past records of different temperature and then damage to the rings that seal off the fuel tanks. So you can see we have a lot of our data over here on the right-hand side. And we can kind of draw this extrapolated curve. The problem was that in the day the Challenger actually exploded, the temperature was very cold. And so really, the averages we'd established over here on the right were not relevant because there's, the data is so far off of what the actual temperature was. And as a result of it being really cold, we ended up having the O-rings, these little seals, um, were too brittle and shrunk a little bit, and fuel mixed away it shouldn't have, and the Challenger blew up. What are some other common problems? Well, some of these machine learning techniques we have are really, really good. So they'll actually overlearn the data. You know, overlearning sounds weird, but imagine this. Imagine that I gave you a quiz every single day on chapter seven of the class, and I give you the same questions every single day. Well, you get really good at answering those questions. But then one day I will say, okay, well, let me change them up a little bit. Let me vary them and then see how you do. You probably do pretty badly because you learned the perfect pattern to answer those questions, but you'd overlearn the data. You weren't flexible. You didn't really learn the concepts well. And so sometimes our really advanced machine learning techniques can really learn about every single data point and then overfit the data. The other option is underfitting. So in underfitting, we have a model that hasn't had enough time to learn the data and doesn't fit it very well. All right, let's talk about visualizations. Now, how do we present information to an audience? Uh, it's good to think about kind of the purposes here. Are we trying to compare things? We're we trying to correlate. Are we looking at distribution, trends, or part the whole? And that will help lead you to the direction of the right kind of chart to pick. Now, your normal default is going to be a bar chart. 
It's usually a good place to start. But you need to understand where do bar charts do a good job and where they do a bad job. So let's think about some of the different charts. So comparison. Comparison is a standard bar chart. Sales today, sales tomorrow. Sales Fairmont, sales Morgantown. That's a great purpose for a comparison bar chart. However, bar charts are not good at showing cause and effect or correlation. If you want to do correlation, you probably want to do a scatter plot. A scatter plot has an X and it has a Y. And it's showing how these two things relate to each other. So this could be temperature on my X plot. And my Y could be sales of popsicles. So obviously as temperature goes up, popsicle sales go up as well. Another question I might have is distribution. So generally comparisons are going to show only a sum or an average of a figure. But I really want to consider how much variation do I have here? How, rather than saying just, you know, how many popsicles do I sell a day, I want to know what's kind of the range of the high to low here. And distribution will tell me how many I have in each point along the way. So I can say on the average day, here's what I sell, but I have a lot of days where I sell a lot more, I have a lot of days where I sell a lot less. Trends typically are time-based, and you typically use a line for time-based information. And then obviously part to whole in our standard pie chart or donut chart. There are some more advanced charts down below, which we're not going to get into as much with this class, but these are also available in Excel, and you can learn about them in future courses. So let's talk about some high quality visualizations. What are some three things to focus on? Well, number one is simplification. This basically says get rid of anything that you don't need. We want to remove chart junk here. We want to focus on answering a single question with a specific visualization. We want to have emphasis. What is the major point we're looking for? And then obviously we want it to be ethical. We don't want to mislead in our, our visualizations. So here's a couple examples of things I can do to kind of clean this up. So one simplification I can use is called distance. So if you look at the top chart, you'll notice that we have a legend at the top upper right corner. Well, I'm having to look over at the blue and then go over to the legend, and then look at the red and then look at the legend, and then look at the green and then look at the legend. So I have a lot of back and forth. So one immediate thing you can do to simplify a chart is to bring the labels close to the data. So in the bottom improvement, I have now my titles are over each of the elements. It's a lot cleaner and easier to understand. Other things we can do is think about our color, weight, or heaviness. So elements that are heavy or more saturated have more emphasis. So one thing you can do with a chart to simplify it out is if you don't really care about a particular data point, you can kind of mute it a little bit. Or data series, you can mute it. So if I'm showing a bunch of data on sales and I want to highlight our new store, I might include all of the dots from every store, but I'll take all the dots and make them a light color and give them a store I want to focus on a heavy color. Same thing for contrast. The heavier a contrast, the, the more it's going to appear. More complexity makes it pop up better. Things that are closer look more related. And the larger, the greater the weight. So again, I can look at the same thing. If I want to do a scatter plot with a whole bunch of data, I can do small dots that are lightly shaded for things I don't want to emphasize and large dots for things I do want to emphasize. We also want to be careful of proportions here as well. So an example here, we can see three different charts all showing the same information but with different pros and cons. The biggest issue with the chart on the left here is the axis. This axis does not start at zero. And so as a result, the difference between a 4.0 and a 3.9 looks really, really big. Well, the true value is shown in the middle here because I have an axis that actually starts at zero. And now I can see it's actually a very small difference between those two. The problem with the one on the left is that Excel will often automatically select a non-zero value down here if there's a small distance between your data points. And typically, it's a really, really bad idea. So one thing I want to emphasize is make sure all of your axes start at zero in the class here. We can also see a problem on the right. A problem on the right has the correct height for each value, but on the left, it makes it very wide, and on the right, it makes it very skinny. Right? So our eyes respond to area as well as height, so you don't want to encode information twice. We also can think about how we can visualize data differently by truncating the data or filtering it off. So we can see on the top here, we have an analysis of the Dow Jones average, which is a bunch of stock indexes. 
And you can see on the bottom how if I pick three different time periods, I can show very different stories. I can tell a story of growth by focusing on the one on the right. I can tell a story of stability in the middle, or I can tell a story of reduction on the right as well. And so you have to be careful about what you choose to start or stop. A classic example of this is inflation right now. If you look at inflation for the last you know, five years, it's going to look like a massive increase. However, if you look at it over the last, say, 30 years, you'll see it's been high, it's gone down, and now it's back up again, which gives a very different view of how inflation works. All right, so hopefully there's just some good sort of introductory terms on looking at visualizations and picking out ways to make your graphics better. As we get in the class, we'll talk a little bit more practically about this as we work with Excel, but hopefully this gives you some of the good overviews to begin with.